Welcome back to the channel guys. We're going to do another installment of the Have You Heard series. So I think I got like seven of them up already. So uh, we're moving pretty, pretty long so far. And so I wanted to do a album today that is going to be back in the jazz genre. Uh, the last one I posted was not jazz. So if you wanted to check that out, if the jazz ones haven't been your thing, um, that, that one was pretty interesting. It was a record I don't, I've never seen a video on. I looked through YouTube too and couldn't find one. So uh, this one is a slightly more known album um, and definitely the players on them are known, but I think it was just one of the earlier ones and probably still doesn't get talked about as much. So this is the leader of this album is actually the piano player. So this is a jazz album and he played on this piano and he played vibra harp. So the vibes were a pretty big thing back in the fifties and uh, into the sixties. They kind of died off in the 70s for the most part. I don't know too many vibe albums that were past the 70s, I think, because then you also started to get in a lot of the synths on the pianos. And so you can kind of mimic those sounds. And so uh, people just kind of seem to go towards those because you mimicked a lot of sounds uh, that you were able to get from keyboards and synthesizers and that sort of stuff, especially as you get into the, you know, kind of that fusion era of, of the jazz world and even music in general. So this particular album is on a jazz label that was a little bit of a smaller label. Now it's still pretty known to people that like jazz. Um, you know, there is a lot of albums on this on this particular label that are known albums. Sonny Rollins has a very famous album uh, that, that was on this label. And so we're going to talk about a album by Victor Feldman. So Victor Feldman was from the UK. He played, like I said, he played piano, and on this particular album, he also played vibra harp. And uh, there's your cover, and you can see right there the name of the lineup on there. It was just a trio setting. You got Scott LaFaro, who played bass, and you got Stan Levy, who was on the drums. And there's your back, and there's your catalog, that C3549. Uh, so Contemporary started with that 3500 series, so this is only, you know, this is title 49 within that 3500 series and I will show you the label of the record and it has that you know big contemporary records that's around it and then the other side apologize that this was upside down um, and you can see it has that deep groove and contemporary records and that's primarily there was their label throughout the 50s uh, all their contemporary albums pretty much had that um, as it went along they started coming out with, you know, stereo pressings. And so you would start to see M for mono and S for stereo. This album was released in stereo a year later. Uh, this came out in 58. And I believe the stereo version came out in 59. And so what's unique about this album is that you have Victor Feldman playing vibes and you have him playing piano. And it's pretty, I like that combination because I feel like when you look at the traditional vibe albums like Milt Jackson and Bobby Hutchinson, um, kind of I think were the two most famous vibe players, they you know they were on every track pretty much. You know, uh, you had the modern jazz uh, modern jazz quartet I think that um, Sonny Rollins actually played in for a little while. A couple, I think he's got one album on Riverside with them, um, and. Uh, I am not a huge fan of having vibes on every single song, but I really like them when they are placed appropriately. And, you know, maybe appropriately is not the right word because I'm sure people love vibes. I, I guess tastefully maybe is the right word to use for it. I like this album because the vibes are used in, it's not overpowering with the vibes. He still has piano in there. And he doesn't have the vibes on every track. So I feel like it doesn't get old. I, my problem with vibes is that I feel like it gets old. I just feel like it's kind of the same sounds over and over again. And so I like, I like when it's broken up a little bit. And this being a trio setting, it's nice when you just get those traditional trio piano, bass, drum songs that are on this album. You know, what drew me to this album originally is that, like I said, you got Scott LaFaro, who's in the middle there. Who played bass and I've mentioned him a couple times already by far my favorite bass player so I, I've I've been I try to seek out any album that he's on because there just isn't that many because unfortunately he died very young 
And so I, I try to seek out any album that has him on it because I really, I just love his playing so much. And Stan Levy was a great drummer. Um, this particular album and contemporary as a label was a West Coast based label. I think it was based out of, uh, yeah, Melrose Place, Los Angeles, California. You can see right there on the address strip. And uh, this was one of the West Coast labels. You had this, you had Pacific Jazz, which was a West Coast label. You know, the movements in the 50s, you had kind of three different camps of jazz. You had the East Coast, which on, you know, on paper, they assume, you know, they were known more as like uh, heavy hitters, hard bop players, was kind of, you know, more swinging. And the West Coast traditionally was labeled more as like a laid back type jazz. However, you listen to some of these contemporary records and by no means are they laid back. Like some of them are really swing hard. And I think contemporary made great stuff. In my personal opinion, I think Contemporary had the most consistent engineering sound. So when you talk about jazz engineering, probably the most famous engineer anyone's going to know of is Rudy Van Gelder. He did Blue Notes. He did Prestige. He did um, some of the, uh, oh gosh, I'm drawing a blank now, but he, he, he mixed and engineered about four or five different labels impulse he 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 mastered impulse if you look on some impulses you'll see you know the very uh famous rvg and the dead wax and that's on all your you know almost all your blue notes on a lot of early prestiges and rudy van gelder what was so smart about him is that he he would engineer and mix to what the label wanted you know, blue notes sound like blue notes, prestiges sound like prestiges, and impulses sound like impulses, but yet they were all mixed and engineered by Rudy Van Gelder. So he was very smart in that respect. He knew how to get a sound that the record label liked. Contemporary, what I liked about Contemporary, and I'm just going to look for you here, um, if it says who actually mixed... I know they say it somewhere on these who actually did the mastering. Um, so it was Apex tape recording mastering um, on contemporaries design and variable pitch. And it doesn't tell me who is my mixer, um, which is interesting. Uh, oh, there you go. Sound by Roy, Roy Dunan and Howard Holzer. And if you look on most contemporaries, they, they pretty much were the group that did them. And I feel like that their equipment and their consistency was just, I've never had a, I've never heard a contemporary record and I've heard, I haven't had many. I'm not going to say I'm an expert in contemporaries, but I've heard a number of them and I've never heard a contemporary that sounded bad. And I really think that that is a testimony to how well they functioned as a smaller label and still got such a good, consistent sound out of all of it. And they would have trumpet players, they would have trombone players, they would have the drummers, bass players, piano players, vibe players, they, you know, every every sort of instrument that's traditionally in jazz music they'd have. And I always felt like it was very consistent mixing. The bass always sounded the same, the piano always sounded the same, the drums always had the same feel, and they'd be different players, but it would be very consistent. But yet you can hear the difference. You could hear that it was a different player. You could hear I mean, because if you think about it, when you play an instrument, and I've heard so many people, you know, so many people get into gear, and this is a little off the record, but, so you know, off the record of the record, not like the metaphor, and uh, you, people are so into gear, they're like, oh, what guitar do you play? What bass do you play? What drum kit do you have? And in the end, no matter what you're playing on, you sound like you. Now, you're playing different notes, different rhythms, you know, you're going to have different inflections, different emphasis on stuff, but primarily you sound like you. And in all the years I've played with people and that I've played, it doesn't matter what you're playing on, you sound like you. If you were the worst player in the world and you had the best gear in the world, you would still sound like you. If you were the best player in the world and you had a $100 guitar, you would still sound amazing because 
you are such a skilled, phenomenal player. And uh, that is what I liked about Contemporary so much. They still sounded like themselves, but then the sound quality and the frequencies were the same. Nothing was overbearing. You didn't get one record where like the drums were just saturated and overpowered the other players or the piano was super blocky and couldn't really get good tone out of it. And that's what I liked about Contemporary Records. It was really consistent. So if you get a chance to check out Arrival of Victor Feldman, it's everywhere on streaming services. You can find it on YouTube. It It isn't a hard album to find. It's just not necessarily an album that gets talked about a whole lot. So I would encourage you to go check it out. It's a really great album, and hopefully you can find it online, enjoy it, and I will see you guys for the next installment of the Have You Heard series next time.